my strength come from mountains? No, my strength comes from God, who made heaven and earth and mountains. He won't let you stumble. Your guardian God won't fall asleep, not on your life. Israel's guardian will never doze or sleep. God's your guardian, right at your side to protect you, shielding you from sunstroke and sheltering you from moonstroke. God guards you from every evil. He guards your very life. He guards you when you leave and when you return. He guards you now and he guards you always. Would y'all stand and sing with us tonight? Let the king
you chose to come and worship with us tonight. If this is your first time with us, uh, welcome. We're really glad that you're here. We're just a group that loves to get together and worship Jesus in the middle of our week in spite of any of our circumstances because he's always worthy no matter if we consider our life good or complicated or tumultuous, whatever, the, whatever your week has been like, Jesus is still worthy of our praise. We've just sung three songs back to back to back about how he always comes through, how he is the best uh, choice for us to run to whenever times get, get hard. The author of uh, Psalm, 46, Psalm 46 would say that God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in times of trouble. Haley read for us at the beginning of worship tonight, Psalm 121, that says, 
I, I need help. So I lift my eyes up to the hills. Does my, does my help come from the hills? No, my help comes from the one who made the skies and the lakes and the, the valleys and also the hills. So my question to you tonight is, do you believe that? Is that true for you? Do you truly look to the creator of all things seen and unseen? Do you really believe that he is a refuge and a strength and an ever-present help in times of trouble? And if you do believe that, then why is it that if you're anything like me, sometimes he's not the one I turn to whenever I need help? Why is it that we try to pick ourselves up, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and go, no, I'm, I'm gonna get, I'm, I've got this. I'm gonna figure this thing out. I'm gonna make sure that this happens. Why do we try to handle things on our own whenever we recognize that our God is the only one who always comes through? I don't know, sometimes I think for me, maybe it's a pride thing. I like to be able to say, yeah, look what I did. Look what I accomplished. Look what I made it through. Look at how strong I am. Look at how much I can persevere. Maybe you're like me in that. Maybe you're not sure that God's plans are going to line up with your plans, and so you'd just rather make sure that your plans are the thing that happens and in spite of whatever it is that God wants. But I'm here to tell you tonight that he does, in fact, work out all things for the good of those who love him. And his plans, though they may not match up and line up with your plans, they are good and they are enough. Before we sing this last song, I want you to check your heart. I want you to check it for, for that pride. I want you to check it for that, for that doubt. And maybe you still sing through the doubt. That's fine. We're going to talk more about doubt in a little bit. But whatever your circumstances are tonight, I, I want you to think, I want you to boil it all down to Jesus, the person who lived and the person who is still working today and will continue to work forever and ever. Is he enough in and of himself? Is he worthy of your praise tonight? And I would say yes. If you strip away all of our accommodations, like things like our, our family legacy that says, okay, Jesus has always gotten our family through. Are you going to be riding your parents' faith if you continue to sing tonight? Or is it truly true that Jesus is enough for you? that he's the one you believe will come through, that, that you put your hope, your confidence, and all of your trust in him. Take a second to think about that. I invite you to ask him to reveal things to your heart right now. And maybe in this next song, this last song we're gonna sing before Evan comes and speaks to us, maybe get down and dirty with the Lord tonight. Get into the nitty gritty and, and let him work some things out in your heart. Because whenever we were singing that God, the battle belongs to you, you, you were really holding on to it for yourself. Or maybe whenever you acknowledge that the darkness trembles before the Lord, maybe you recognize that you don't. Or whenever we say, let the king of my heart be the one I run to, you're saying, no, I'd rather stay over here. Examine your heart and have the Holy Spirit examine your heart for a few moments. I'm going to shut up. I'm going to let y'all have some time with the Lord. Father, I thank you for uniting us tonight to sing your praises, to, to hear your word proclaimed, and to be transformed. So God, as we've asked you to reveal our heart to ourselves and to you, God, as we sing this song, 
may we not just see words up on a screen or hear a melody in the air or, or let our emotions get the better of us, but, but may it be a bold declaration that this song, this hour, most importantly, our lives are just worship, authentic and real for who you are. Our help, our joy, our hope, all of our confidence in the one who loves us. And God, right now, as we stand, we just surrender our lives to you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Would y'all stand and let's sing one more song together.
for leading us in worship. Uh, always a privilege to get to worship with you guys uh, and an honor to get to be led by, by Johnny and your team. So uh, you guys, thank you for being here tonight. We know that there are other things you could be doing and you chose to give us an hour of your time and we don't take that for granted. And so um, over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about something uh, that I hope is not offensive to you, but I've had enough conversations about it. Uh, to know that not everyone is going to agree with my take here. And so we'll just start with that. My understanding of doubt as expressed in Scripture is that it is a natural part of a growing faith, that it is a justifiable um, stopping place or, or stopping point in our faith. It's not somewhere that we would want to res reside I had a professor who say, uh, doubt's a wonderful or a, a suitable place to visit, but a terrible place to reside. I don't think it's uh, viewed in Scripture as sinful or even negative. Now, there are people that would claim that doubt is the opposite of faith, that you are either faithful, being uh, a believing in who God is and what He says He did and what He says He's going to do, or you're doubting. I'm going to argue that that's a false dichotomy. It's an unnecessary separation of two things that are related but not in conflict. I do think the opposite of faith is disobedience. I do not think it's doubt. I think there is a biblical understanding of processing through faith where we wrestle through certain aspects of that faith in order to grow in a deeper, richer relationship with God. And so if you want to replace the word doubt, although I'm going to use the word doubt, if you want to replace that in your head with, with maybe wrestling, or if you want to replace that in your head with, with struggling, if that makes you feel better, that's perfectly fine. But I'm going to use the word doubt. My personality is not one that likes to dwell on things. Occasionally, uh, I have to lead meetings, 
um, in, our, uh, in our staff and with our college ministry and with our student ministry, and I'm not good at it. I, I don't know how to stay on track ever, and so luckily I've hired some people that help me stay on track and then uh, get to work with Stacy, who helps me stay on track, but I'm not one that wants to stay on any one thing for very long. Our meetings are about an hour and a half every Monday morning. We have about six minutes of content and then an hour and 24 minutes of chasing rabbits in every direction. Right? I, I try sometimes to fake it. We meet with our CG leaders uh, on uh, Sunday nights, and I fake it for that group because I know they have other places to be. But who else wants to go to their office on Monday morning? They'd rather be meeting with me. So I don't honor their time. Uh, but that's my, my natural state. Right? I, I don't like to dwell on things. I don't like to struggle with things. And so in a growing faith, when these things have come up, particularly when I was younger, right, I didn't want to wrestle with them. I didn't want to struggle into a conclusion. I wanted to pull out a platitude, right, a, a good fortune cookie saying. I wanted to uh, get something really quick and quippy. Uh, and I wanted to, to read it to myself and go, okay, all that's settled. And then I want to move on to something else. And I think probably I was smart enough to know, but I kept doing it, that that same thing's just going to come back up the next time crisis hits. Right? Platitudes are, are, are perfectly fine and good when things are going well. Right? Quippy sayings uh, with no real weight um, or depth are great when things are going fine. But when crisis hits, when, when traumatic situations come up, when we find ourselves at our wit's end, we quickly realize those platitudes are not helpful. Right? Maybe you've lost a loved one and you had very well-meaning people say things to you like, well, God must have needed another angel. Right? That's not biblical or true. Uh, and, and so, but they, they thought they were helping, right? And I'm going to guess if you were the one in pain, I hope you weren't the one saying that, though we've probably all done it. But I'm going to guess if you were the person in pain, that did nothing to alleviate it. Right? When we're in crisis, platitudes just aren't enough. We need something thicker and richer. And I think God will offer that if we will bring to Him our doubts and our struggles. And so what we're going to look at over the next three, uh, three weeks at least, maybe four, I can't think that far ahead, uh, the next three or four weeks, we're going to look at this topic of doubt. This week, we're going to be in Luke chapter 7. We're going to look at John the Baptist and his episode of doubt. Uh, we are going to look at Habakkuk chapter 1 and chapter 2 next week, and then we're going to look at Job 38. What you will find notably missing out of this doubt series is anything about our beloved friend Thomas, who just like you would have, if someone died and then all your friends said, hey, that guy that we all saw died isn't dead anymore, and so he came and saw us, but you just need to take our word for it, just like Thomas, you would probably say, I'm going to need to see that to believe it. So we're not going to look at Thomas, nor are we going to call him uh, that awful name he's been coined with uh, for the last 2,000 years, uh, very unfairly, I'd like to add. So, Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 18. So this is in the midst of Jesus' public ministry. The disciples of John reported all these things, that is, all the things Jesus was doing, to him. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? When the men came to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And in that hour, he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. On many who were blind, he bestowed sight. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind relieved, receive their sight. The lame walk, lepers are clean, the, uh, cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up. The poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. 
When John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in king's courts. So then what did you go see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Um, there's a lot happening here. I'm going to look at a couple different parts in here. First, let's set up what John is going through. So, John is John the Baptist, who not too long prior to this, baptized Jesus. And if, you'll, if you are familiar with the story of Jesus' baptism, it was no ordinary baptism. I think baptism is a significant thing. We do it up here in the, uh, in the baptistry, and it's really cool. And if people know you and, and had an impact on your life, then they can stand up, your Sunday school teachers and Bible study leaders and friends and family, and uh, you go down and you come up, and then everybody claps for you, and then you get a certificate. I don't know why we started doing that, but Baptist churches do that everywhere. It's your ticket to heaven. Get a certificate uh, that says when you were baptized. And then you uh, get to leave, right? And you come and sit down in the church with your wet hair so people know that you were the one that was baptized. Baptism looked a little different back then in that, one, it was not in the synagogue. It was in the public waterways. And two, you often weren't greeted with a round of applause when you came up, but consternation and, and annoyance by the Jewish parents that raised you to be Jewish. And now you're following this new guy who says he's Messiah when we're all still waiting for the Messiah. You would have lost your position in your family, uh, which likely meant lost your ability to make a living because that's what you did is whatever your father did. And so it was a much different picture. But even then, Jesus's was different than a normal baptism then. You see, Jesus, when he just is walking along the banks, John stops what he's doing and he says, I've been talking about this person that's coming. That's him. That's the guy that I've been talking about over the past weeks and months as I've been baptizing you. This is the Messiah that we've been waiting for. Recognizes Jesus immediately as the Messiah. And then Jesus comes and says, I'm not even worthy to tie his sandals. I cannot baptize you. You need to baptize me. And Jesus says, no, you'll baptize me. And he's baptized. The heavens open, whatever that means. And Something like a dove descends down onto the head of Jesus, and a voice from heaven says, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. John experienced all of that. John saw every bit of that. And listen, I, I've come to be less and less um, swayed by my memories, right? It just seems uh, the more study we do, the more we realize that our memories are bad. But I, I'd like to think if I baptized the Messiah, who my ancestors had waited thousands of years on, who I identified walking up to me, and then after I baptized him, a heavens open, dove descending voice out loud said, this is my son. I think I'd remember that. That seems, something, uh, seems like something that we would probably all commit to memory, regardless of your position on Jesus today, if you were a part of something that big and that grand and that out of the ordinary, surely you would remember it. And yet now we find John, and John's in prison. John knows what's going to happen. He probably doesn't know how, but right, they, didn't, they didn't sentence people who were developing followers. Right? If you're familiar with this season in Rome, we call it the Pax Romana, hundreds of years. I think it was actually a thousand years of no war. But the way that Rome maintained that was anybody who started to develop a following, they would just kill. 
And so when he's imprisoned, there is no go here, wait for a while, we'll let you out when you do your sentence. He knew that most likely, unless something supernatural happened before then, he was going to be killed. And things do not look like what John had expected. John had waited anxiously for this Messiah to come. Probably had painted all sorts of pictures about what this new king would look like how this new king would reign, right? We don't need a lot to get up in our head and start playing the game, right? Uh, talking to, to MJ yesterday about if I won the lottery. I don't even play the lottery, but I regularly sit down and go, what if I had $700 million? What would I do first? And then who would I give this to? And what would I do there? And how would I take care of my parents? And then what about the in-laws? And what would we do? I don't even play the game. I'm not going to win. And yet I can still get up in my head about what things might look like. This is the guy who was anxiously awaiting this Messiah that he was confident he would meet one day. And so I am certain because he's a human, he had played the fantasy game of what might this new Messiahship look like? How might this king rule? And Jesus could not be further from that. And so even John, one who baptized Jesus, heard the voice, saw the dove, says, hey guys, I need you to do me a favor. Would you go to Jesus and just make sure he is the one we're waiting for? I don't know what you expected life after coming to faith might look like, but you might find yourself now Right, having experienced death to life, right? That's what happens when you got saved. You didn't go from, from bad to good. Right? Jesus doesn't make bad people good, he makes dead people alive. And so when you came from death to life, right, seems like something maybe we'd want to remember, right? We came from death to life, and now we find ourselves in a position that we're uncomfortable with, and maybe you too are going, All right, God, if it if it really is you, could you just confirm it for me? Right? And this isn't like shallow, uh, God, if you're really there, let me pass this test I didn't study for. Right? God, if you're really there, help me get this boyfriend or girlfriend that I really like right now. God, if you're really there, then I really want this promotion. God, if you're really there, get me this job. God, if you're really there, let me get this internship. Right? That's not what we're talking about. But out of the earnestness of our heart, not out of what we can get, but simply so we can feel God's presence, we go, God, if you're really there, make it known to me. God, I believe, but just, just help me in my unbelief right now. And Jesus, when they ask him this, doesn't say, you go back and tell John that I already showed him how good I am and he needs to remember that. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, shame on John. All that we've been through and now he's going to ask if I'm really the one? No, he says, you go back and you tell John about how much you've seen me do. You see, we've got a responsibility to one another that when we're not John, because we do have seasons of being John, that we need to be his disciples, right? We need to be the ones who are going, hey, let me tell you. I know you're struggling to see God right now. Let me tell you what he's doing around me. Right? The early church had a, a lot of different variations, a lot of different looks, but there was a similar pattern in all the early churches. They read the apostles, right, or, or studied the apostles in their teaching. That'd be kind of like our gospels, right? They, they read the law. That'd be most of our Old Testament, right? They uh, broke bread together, right? They had meals together. We're good at that. They sang hymns together, right? They, they read the Psalms, but they sang songs together. We do that pretty well. They prayed prayers together. We do that pretty well. But the other thing they did was they shared testimony with one another, and we do not do that very well. We are not great about going, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. I'd like to catch you up on what God has been doing in my life. And most of us would feel wildly uncomfortable having that conversation with somebody. Right, but sometimes when people are in John's position and they're looking around and going, I had a really good picture of what life might be looking like and none of it's checking out right now, that we need to be the ones going, well, let me tell you about what I've seen Jesus doing. Right, 
Jesus says, just, just check my resume. Right? See all the things that I've been doing in your life, that I've been doing in the people's lives around you, and you go report that back to John. Go let John know I'm still working. And it may not look like he thought it was going to look, but I'm still here. I'm still moving. Right? I'm still headed towards the same end I've always been headed towards, even if you misunderstood what that was going to look like. So they go back and we trust that, that John probably did go, okay, yeah, man, I needed that reminder right now. Right, he's going to have his head cut off in a couple days and he's going to be served up on a platter because the woman's pretty bitter and mad at him. Uh, but he's going he's gonna to have this. So now let's shift to Jesus' pretty weird next few lines. On ancient Roman coins, Herod had uh, reeds swaying in the wind. That was the, the picture on a coin. And so this is what I, I think Jesus is saying. And he gets very direct in his second question. He says, did you go out there to see reeds swaying, right? Did you go out to see people in fine clothing? No, if you wanted to see that, you go to a king. He says, no, you went to go see a prophet. And that's what I think Jesus is getting at. That somewhere, neither one of those things, but a little bit of both of those things is where Jesus is. Right, because that is, in the end, what this passage is about. It's not even necessarily about John's doubt. It's about who Jesus is. That's the question that all of the Gospels are seeking to answer. Right? Jesus says, look, if you were wanting a, a king who's going to sit on a throne and give you power and give you status and give you position, then you need to go to the, king, the, the, the castles for that. You need to go to the, to the, the throne rooms for that. That's not where I'm going to be sitting. But Jesus also isn't just a prophet, though he's been claimed to be such. Right? He's not just a good teacher that talks about the things God is doing. He is the fulfillment of the prophecies that the prophets foretold. C.S. Lewis once said that uh, to claim Jesus is a good teacher is, is not acceptable. You can either claim he is a lunatic on the same level as a man who thinks he's a poached egg... I don't know what a poached egg is. I think they eat them in England. Or he's a liar from the pit of hell. Or he is who he said he was. But to say that he was simply a good teacher, Jesus did not leave that option on the table, nor did he intend to. Right? He says, look, I'm not up in the castle. I'm not just talking about what's going to come. I am the thing that's coming. But I'm going to look much differently than you thought I was going to. I'm not going to meet your expectations if your expectations are a smooth life of power, status, and might, or an easy life of platitudes with no action. I'm going to be a king, but I'm going to lead from a humble position I'm going to be murdered at 33 I'm going to raise again three days later and then I'll be back again I've told people the last couple of weeks um, we're getting ready to start planning our summer out right we're, we're starting to look ahead at things right we're starting to look towards even next semester and that looming question in the back of our minds always is, are we going to actually get to do these things this time? And I've told a couple people this week, I refuse to make any more predictions because so far I've been wrong every single time on what I think the next step is going to look like. Same way, every time I think I understand fully the way God is going to move and work in my life, I've been wrong. Every prediction's wrong. Right? I have no interest in predicting when he's going to come back or how. 
I have no interest in predicting uh, uh, of what portions of Revelation are literal and which are symbolic. I don't have any interest in trying to predict the thousand years before or after or none of the above. I have no interest in doing that because every time I've tried to make a prediction about even the easy things, I end up being wrong. So I'm not going to uh, uh, busy myself trying to do the hard stuff. What I'm going to try to focus in on is right now and right here, I'm going to try to be obedient to God's leading. In seasons of doubt, in seasons of wonder, in seasons of crisis, I'm not going to quit being obedient and I'm going to settle into those things and wrestle with them. Despite my inclination to just dust them off, offer a platitude and move on and pretend like it doesn't bother me anymore, I want to settle in and wrestle while remaining obedient to the call that he's put on my life. He says, look, I, I'm not any of the above. Whatever category you want to put me in, I'm different than that too. And if we're maturing and growing in our faith, we're going to come up against things that are difficult to comprehend. And Jesus isn't going to say, get over it and just do what I say and don't ask questions. Right? I do that as a parent. That's lazy parenting. He's also not going to say, shame on you, how dare you question anything. He's going to allow us to wrestle in our obedience as we continue to grow into the people that he desires for us to be. This is such a gracious response from Jesus. Right? He finishes with a, a really... Uh, seemingly paradoxical compliment and sort of insult to John where he says, look, if we're going to go ahead and rank people, right, among all the people born of women, which so far unanimous, right, all of us so far uh, have been born of a woman, and he says that of, of those people, he's the best. And then I don't know if he... Uh, is just smart enough and wise enough to recognize people are going to start trying to follow people instead of Jesus. But he goes, but in the kingdom of God, we're not ranking. So even the least of these is greater than him, right? And in the kingdom of God, the least is greater. And so then if he's, if he's uh, less than the least, then maybe he's actually, I don't know. But what I think he's trying to say is we're not, we're not doing the ranking. But if we were, John's the top and even he's struggling here. Right, this isn't a time to beat yourself up and to shame on you to yourself because we're, we're really good at that. It's just simply a time when you come up against these things to settle in and struggle through our faith. God is far bigger than your struggles. Right? Never once has God said, oh no, I was really hoping they wouldn't doubt that. I don't really have a good answer for that thing. Right. Oh, they really found my weak spot. I really was hoping they would just kind of ignore that. Right? Never once has your doubt and struggle worried God. It's the God of the universe, creator of all things seen and unseen. He's big enough to handle what you're struggling with. But we've got to be big enough to take it to him. Go, God, I believe but I need some help here. Show me you're still moving. Let's pray. God, you're good, and you're for our good. So grateful for it. Give us when we take it for granted. God, I pray that you would do something in the lives of these students and through the lives of these students that we can't explain by any other means. I think God did that. God, do something so big in our community, in our ministry, in our campuses, in our workplaces. And we couldn't take credit, credit for it even if we wanted to. It's in your lovely name we pray. Amen. I know you make a way And 
I don't always understand And I don't always get to see But I will believe it Yes, I will believe it Cause you make mountains move And you make giants fall And you use songs of praise To shake prison walls So I will speak to my fear I will preach to my doubt that you were faithful then and you will be faithful now.
I'm the careless and the praise. I know nothing has been wasted, no failure or mistake. You're in